Hi, and welcome to the Library 2035 Imagining the Next Generation of Libraries webcast series. My name is Sandy Hirsch, and I'm the editor of this book. I'm pleased to host this webcast series featuring several of the book's contributing authors who will share their vision for libraries over the next decade. Today, I welcome Jason Griffey, author of Chapter 2, Predictions about Future Technology in Libraries and Epistemic Collapse, Laws and Models. Jason Griffey is Director of Strategic Initiatives at NISO. He was previously a technology consultant for libraries, an affiliate at Meta Lab, and a fellow and affiliate at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University, and an academic librarian at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. Throughout chapter two, Jason Griffey highlights how the library of 2035 will continue performing its role in recording and archiving our historical past, while also helping society create and access customized user created and user manipulated media, such as books and stories, video and movies and music. These developments are making it challenging for libraries to manage the explosion of generated content today, alluding to the increased complexity libraries will face in managing content and collections in libraries in 2035. It is almost unimaginable. So with that, I'd love to welcome Jason Griffey. I'm really excited to talk to you today. Hey, Sandy, it's so great to be here. Thanks so much for uh, involving me in this project. It's my pleasure. So let's get started. I'd love to hear you describe your vision for the future of libraries in 2035. Sure. Um, so the chapter outlines a very sort of specific and narrow part of what I think are some of the challenges coming down for libraries and the sort of ecosystem of libraries over the next uh, 10 years. And the sort of vision that I lay out in that is fairly dystopian. And I, I want to say up front that I am not nearly as pessimistic as the chapter and even what I'm about to say maybe um, would uh, would indicate. But I do think that the, the next 10 years, specifically the next five or so years of uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning systems, especially those involved in things like generative media, generative content, are going to be very, very challenging for uh, the library space, the publishing space, uh, the sort of entire information ecosystem. So those are the, that's the, the, the vision is that things are going to get real complicated real fast. Um, it's going to challenge our sort of preconceptions about some of the foundations, some of the foundational expectations of our work, like what is metadata? Uh, what is a book? What is a discovery tool? What is a search engine? Like all of these things that are fundamental pieces of the work we do every day are going to change radically as a result of these tools. And that worries me a little bit. Well, that's a great segue to my next question. So what about that worries you? What what are you most concerned about in that future? Yeah, um, so the, the chapter outlines a sort of uh, deeper understanding of, uh, of, of exactly what it is I'm concerned about. But the, the sort of top level concern is that as these tools, uh, generative machine learning tools, get better and better and better and better, and better at creating media that people want to consume, right? So whether that's a book or uh, audio or video or whatever, right now we're sort of in a space where the systems are pretty good at generating text that is uh, legible and understandable and even at times amusing. It may not be incredibly original, but um, if you go to some of these you know, Google Bard or ChatGPT or some of these other generative AI tools, you can prompt it to create a fairly complicated and um, readable text. Same with images, you can sort of prompt in order to get these fanciful, you know, uh, images out of the uh, out of the generative um, system. These will only get better, right? Technology doesn't ever uh, sort of slide backwards short of something like nuclear war or zombie apocalypse. We never get to the point where the technology is getting worse. 
So we can pretty easily look at the next five to 10 years and say that these systems are going to get more and more effective at doing this, which means audio, video um, are all going to become sort of trivially, uh, uh, trivially, trivially generate, generated. That, um, that process, sort of it getting better and better and better, makes it easier and easier for people to um, take part in. And so my concern is, uh, sort of writ large, that we don't have the tools or the systems that are capable of dealing with a world where the primary mechanism that people use for reading is generated media rather than sort of traditionally published media. Um, and I think one of the examples that I use is something like imagine a um, imagine a grade school child sitting down in front of their computer and on their or on their phone, you know, on whatever device they happen to be using, and saying, "I would like this kind of book. Give me a book that is um, like the Chronicles of Narnia, but stars Percy Jackson and has my two best friends in it, right?" And for a machine learning system, that's a fairly trivial sort of ask. And again, as they get better and better, this sort of thing gets easier and easier. And that 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 child would be given then a bespoke, one of a kind, original um, story. Now, is it a great story? I don't know, but it's exactly the story that the kid wants. It's it has the things right that the child has asked for in it. And so like what what is that? Is that a is that a book? Is that something we can collect? Is that something that um, that we have the capacity to sort of catalog? If if that kid shares it with their friends, right, and they want to read it, like how does that work? Um, when you think about something like a summer reading program and uh, you know a few thousand kids all generating their own books to read, like what does that even look like? So these this sort of increasingly easy to do uh, media creation, uh, especially bespoke individualized media creation, really concerns me from a archiving collective knowledge, um, you know, comparative, uh, com comparative reality, like there's just a whole lot of things that get that, that go really weird and sideways in libraries and our expectations about the way that media works uh, when that world comes sort of into full fruition. Yeah, thank you, Jason. That's such an interesting set of challenges um, for us to be puzzling through as we look to the future. What about the future are you most excited about? Um, I mean, I'm excited about a lot of things. The the discoverability angle with these tools, um, I, I mentioned um, just as one sort of piece of things that might change would be sort of search engines and, and, and other discoverability tools. The, um, the world of discoverability in uh, using AI and machine learning systems is just so much more robust than it is using our traditional understanding sort of the information science classic way of doing search and discovery where you have, you know, data and metadata and you're doing some sort of ranking algorithm that um, that determines how things get, you know, presented to you. Um, one example, this is uh, an example that that uh, just happened this week that sort of amazed me in um, how different discovery is with a uh, with the machine learning system. So I, um, for uninteresting reasons, I needed a list of songs that were about plants or flowers. Okay, so uh, I needed say 50 songs that were about plants or flowers. Um, I have no idea how I would go about doing that search in a traditional search engine. Right. Like it would have to have been 
already made a list and somehow the search engine found the list and presented it to me, but it would have to be an existing set of content somehow. Um, or I would have to like crowdsource it, right? And ask like on social media or something and ask other people to sort of do some of the lifting for me and suggest songs. Um, one of the advantages of machine learning systems is that they are sort of pre crowdsourced. They've already been trained on like huge amounts of input. So it's all, it's like a pre crowdsourcing algorithm. So um, I went to chat GPT and I said, you know, I'm building a playlist. Give me 50 songs that are about plants and flowers. And it took it about eight seconds. And I had a list of songs about plants and flowers and they were all, you know, they all were indeed about plants and flowers and they were all real songs and they had, um, and they had, uh, the artist and the, and the title there. So that interaction was just so fundamentally different than a traditional information science, library science, um, search and discovery process that I find super exciting. And I'm really interested to sort of see how that sort of thing progresses. Great, thank you. Yeah, that is really um, exciting to think about how uh, that will change our behaviors and uh, what kind of information we'll be able to leverage in the future. So looking backwards um, in the past, what do you think has had the biggest impact on libraries over the last decade? Yeah, the last decade has been really interesting. So, you know, if we if we think, you know, we're in 20, 2024, this book is sort of thinking about 2025 and looking forward to 2035. If we go back to 2014, 2015, um, I was thinking about this question and thinking about sort of where were we and what was going on. We were already sort of well into the smartphone revolution, like the previous 10 years from that, like 2004 to 2014 or so. I would have said it was the sort of shift to mobile and all of that, that, that technology really exploded and everything. But from 14 to 24, the thing that I think for me, looking in at libraries and sort of watching the changes, the thing that has made the biggest difference um, has not been a sort of a technology, but instead has been a model and that model shifting. And that is, uh, the way that library financial models and funding models and such have shifted from the traditional physical um, uh, model where you know you buy an item and then you can lend it out as many times as you want um, to a rental model where now we are you know at, at least in a lot of public libraries um, and even some academics you know a vast majority of the budgeting is going to effectively renting content rather than owning content through um, ebook models or through streaming models for either audio or video. And that shift is sort of a fundamental shift in the history of libraries as, as, a, as a model for the way we do things. I think that's the biggest change um, in the last 10 years that, that I've been sort of paying attention to and looking at. Thank you, Jason. What about looking ahead into the next decade? What do you think is going to have the biggest impact on libraries? Um, I mean, I would love to say uh, awesome technology is going to make things awesomer, but uh, <laughs> I think, you know, the 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 concerns and the, the things that I think the things that I think are going to have the most impact are probably the things that I think are also going to create the most challenges. And part of that is going to be the technology. Uh, part of that is going to be um, the sort of continued diversification of the sorts of things libraries have to pay attention to. We've got, you know, obviously audio video, uh, um, audio video uh, uh, text, We've got now a lot of libraries obviously collecting games. Um, some libraries are collecting, um, you know, obviously physical objects and tools. We're moving sort of in the next 10 years into, I think, an AR and VR set of experiences where there's going to be this increasingly complicated digital media that needs to be uh, collected, shared, and archived. And I'm not at all sure how that's gonna work. Um, the we as we record this we're about a week 
from the release of Apple's first VR, AR, XR headset, uh, Apple Vision Pro. Um, Apple has a history of pushing the technology space forward by sort of not being the first mover in a space, like the iPhone was not the first smartphone, uh, but it did sort of radically shift the landscape. I think the, the Apple Vision Pro, while incredibly expensive and ridiculous, and almost no one will buy one, um, it points a direction where um, this new sort of VR, AR, XR experience, this, uh, what do they call it? Spatial computing is the term that Apple is using. Hmm. Um, this sort of experience like, is going to create a whole new set of things we have to worry about um, as far as, again, collecting, sharing, and archiving. And that, um, I think, is um, interesting and exciting and challenging and um, will be definitely a 10-year sort of project as these things get smaller and cheaper. In the, in, I, I expect them to follow very, very similarly to the sort of smartphone model where, you know, the first... First ones were incredibly expensive and didn't work for nearly anyone because of limited carriers and all of that. And then, you know, obviously, then they ate the world. So um, <laughs> I think, you know, we can, um, we may see a similar sort of trajectory over the next 10 years. Um, and so that's, I think, super interesting. On top of obviously the AI and ML, uh, the artificial intelligence and machine learning stuff that I've already um, talked about that is only going to get better, faster, more efficient, more reliable. Um, all of those things are going to continue to um, influence the world over the next 10 years in sort of weird ways. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Jason. And uh, it's been a few months since you submitted your manuscript um, for the book. I was wondering if any of your thinking has changed since you wrote the chapter. Yeah, um, it has, uh, and only only in sort of a more solidified way. I think uh, when I began writing the chapter, the chapter was based on some presentations sort of that I had used to help work out the idea. And um, so the, the chapter is sort of a distillation of what was already some thinking going on maybe a year or so beforehand. Um, and then having had another... I don't even remember eight months uh, or something since uh, since I sort of turned the chapter in. I think the what's really changed is that I'm sort of more certain than ever that things are going to be real weird. Like when I wrote the chapter, I was pretty convinced that um, machine learning and artificial intelligence was going to cause some pretty severe. Um, I think what we what I, the term that, that that I use in the title is epistemic collapse, right? And that's a little hyperbolic from a former philosophy student, but uh, it is a, I don't think an overblown way of describing uh, what I can see sort of on the edges of the, on the periphery of these tools and their implementation in the world, the way people are using them, the way, um, the way I expect them to sort of move forward, the, you know, I had joked earlier, you know, what is metadata? What is a book? What is a movie? I think those those sort of weird fundamental questions are going to be um, are going to be something that just keep keep coming up. And I'm more sort of uh, convinced of that now than even I was when I wrote the when I wrote the chapter. So. So I was wondering, Jason, do you have any advice for information professionals as they're trying to navigate this new future? Yeah, I, I thought about this. I thought about this question a lot. Um, I and I think my fundamental piece of of advice and this I, I don't think has changed much, actually, in the last uh, little bit, the last 10 years, probably. Um, and I don't think it'll change for the next 10 years. But uh, I think for libraries specifically, my advice is to be very, very careful about the outsourcing of your expertise. And that is um, when it comes to things that are important to the library, fundamental aspects of, of library um, system services, that sort of thing, be really careful about outsourcing it, especially when, uh, when the expertise should be in the library. 
And that is uh, something that I think we've seen has really long-term negative effects. It does often have short-term benefits. There are often sort of short-term gains to be made, but I think long-term, um, there's fairly large negative effects that come from outsourcing expertise. So my advice to libraries and librarians is uh, the things that are important to you, own them and be have them in house and uh, be able to control and to um, leverage that expertise as much as possible um, locally. So, and do you have a specific example that you could provide about you know that expertise that you maybe we want to be careful about outsourcing? Yeah, I mean, my history is in technology and libraries, and so mm -hmm. you know when I think about this, I think largely about technology and the the um, uh, the last sort of couple of decades of mostly IT and systems services sort of being um, not maybe not entirely outsourced but certainly you know not a central part of library functionality in all cases especially in public libraries often it's sort of off or you know some other some other um, piece it's not owned by the library so that's a that's one that's particularly interesting given how central technology is to library functionality to me um, but even things like the you know search and discovery process like having someone in the library rather than just relying on a vendor to um, uh, manipulator or fix things for you. Having someone that understands it in the library and can act as an advocate and work with the systems, you know, it's just it's it's always better to have a person uh, in in the house that knows you know how to fix the thing. So yeah, thank you. And is there anything that you think that information professionals can do to prepare better prepare for their desired future? Yeah, I mean, I think the answer to this is just keep learning all the time. And that's something that I think libraries and librarians are particularly good at, as opposed to some other professions. But um, resist the urge to um, resist the urge to uh, um, not embrace the new and um, try very hard to be as open as you can to learning about whatever the new thing is. The, it may not always work out. There's certainly things that we should stop doing, you know, as we, as we sort of learn that they're not as valuable, but um, always, always be learning. That's the, that's the key to any sort of future preparation is know, know what's around the corner and, you know, what is the Gretzky quote, skate to where the puck is going to be, yeah. um, not where it is. So, yeah. Great. I, I couldn't agree. I couldn't agree with you more on that. Um, so are there um, certain key competencies that you think librarians will particularly need to thrive in 2035? Yeah, I, you know, the, 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 general sort of information literacy competencies are going to be even more important understanding and evaluating information being able to filter um, misleading or disinformation from uh, fact-based and or reality-based information uh, those skills are going to get real important over the next 10 years uh, even more so than now the um, that sort of general basic understanding of information literacy and the ability to um, sort of use tools to get at fundamental truths rather than at uh, filter bubbles or other things um, are that's going to be a, a, a big, a big, big, big deal. So I think if I had to put my money, if, you know, if you, we were at a roulette table and you asked me to put my money on one thing, I think that's the one that's going to get the most play in the next 10 years. Great. Thank you. And I have one last question for you. And that is, I'd love for you to define your view of the future of libraries in six words or less. 
Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I had, I, I really worked on this one too. Um, so six words. <clears throat> okay, so the my view of the library in six words, uh, the future of the library. Um, so I, I, I went with fundamental for a healthy and functional society. That's my excellent. View. That's I like that. Them, so. I think that's a great way for us to conclude our our webcast with you. Jason Griffey, thank you so much for joining me today and for your contribution to Library 2035, Imagining the Next Generation of Libraries. It's been a real pleasure to talk with you today and hear more about your vision for the future of libraries. So thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you for attending this webcast um, with Jason Griffey, author of Chapter 2, Predictions about Future Technology in Libraries and Epistemic Collapse, Laws and Models. To view additional author webcasts from this Library 2035 webcast series, please visit the link or use the QR code on your screen. And thank you all again for attending.